Thank you for joining us today. This is Pastor Mark Biltz coming to you from El Shaddai Ministries. Be blessed and shalom. Let's open with prayer here. You have your Hebrew caps on tonight? Okay. Heavenly Father, Abba Father, uh, Lord, you know everything that's going on in the world. Uh, Father, let alone what goes on in our own individual worlds. And Father, as long as we're, we're, we draw close to you, you will draw close to us. As you are Yahweh Shema, you are the Lord who is there. Uh, you are an everlasting presence. And Father, we thank you that uh, we know who you are. Sanctified is your name. Uh, you are a God who is powerful and full of love. And we thank you for that, for your Torah, in Yeshua's name. I want to mention that January 10th, Rabbi Lappin will be here on a Monday night. And I encourage all of you, Rabbi Lappin, of course, is Daniel Lappin is an um, international uh, figure. A lot of people consider him everyone's rabbi, and uh, it's enjoyable. I would encourage all of you to be here for that. And also on January 24th on this night, uh, Rabbi Orkheim Richmond from the Temple Institute in Jerusalem will be here, which will re be as exciting uh, because of all of the things. He is a director of the Temple Institute who's building the temple, rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, or that's what they're attempting to do. The only thing they're missing is the real estate. But they have so many of the other things and uh, the insight into the, and I don't have time really to talk about the tabernacle or the temple, but a big key to prayer is understanding the tabernacle and the temple and all of the pieces that are in it, the significance of it, and uh, what, what uh, the Temple Institute knows, what, what uh, Chaim Richmond can share with us is, is going to be phenomenal. So I encourage everybody to tell everybody to, to be a part of that. Um, also uh, in, in St. Louis, um, which was a, a Hebrew Roots conference that we're at, of course, Pastor Mark taught in these breakout sessions. He wasn't a main speaker, but he got to speak three different breakout sessions. And uh, so there was, it was a smaller venue, maybe uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 people in the room. And, um, and he taught on a number of significant things like replacement theology and uh, on Cahil, the, the, the woman of valor, and and, um, and some of the other jots and tittles that he does. And, and uh, so there were three separate sessions and the room kept filling up. But it was interesting walking around the hotel and being in the elevator and hearing, because nobody, it wasn't even announced who these breakout speakers were. Some people didn't even know that Mark was there. And people in the elevator were saying, yeah, and he talked about Solomon and you would be Constantine and you wouldn't believe. And, uh, and, and just people were excited because of what he shared. So that's your pastor. So he needs some rest tonight. Okay, and uh, there is no Oneg this Saturday as well. We, we, uh, we thought that if some of you want to spend time with your family, uh, that uh, you can do that on Saturday since it's a, it's a holiday for a lot of people. And uh, those of you, some of you may know that, uh, that tonight is the beginning of the winter solstice, which is December 21st. But also tonight there is a lunar eclipse, which is known, about, known as the blood moon. Uh, the reason El Shaddai Ministries became international, in, internationally known was because of the work that Pastor Mark did on the eclipses, not only the lunar, the lunar eclipses, but the solar eclipses, and it, 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 it got international renown, and El Shaddai is known all, and Pastor Mark's known around the world, but it's, uh, it's no coincidence that tonight is a lunar eclipse. Uh, the tenth, or I'm sorry, the, this past Friday was the tenth of the month, Hebrew month of Tevet. Uh, it was a fast day. It was the day that Nebuchadnezzar breached the, the northern part of the wall in Jerusalem. And uh, so the significance of the eclipse, I'm not going to go into it because I'm not teaching on eclipse tonight, but of course Pastor Mark had it all figured out. And uh, I'll just read you this little part, and then if you want to know the rest, you can dog him on Saturday about it. He'll probably share about it. But it says the reason is 456 years, a lunar cycle is 19 years, and seven times over a 19-year time frame, the biblical calendar has a month added to keep it in sync. It's called Adar II. We add a day every four years and leap years to keep things in sync. The Jews add a month seven times over 19 years. You will notice 456 divides by 19, 24 times. And then he goes into the significance of the number 19 and 24. And 19 has to do with rebellion and apostasy. I'm not going to tell you any more. 
Um, but this is a, a lunar eclipse after the fast of Tevet when Israel was, when the walls of Jerusalem or the temple was breached. So you can dog him about this on Saturday. Because who knows what will happen tomorrow. Two weeks ago, uh, Pastor Mark shared on connecting the covenants. That's where we are in our series on Yeshua, uh, our cornerstone. I'm going to share a little bit more about covenants tonight, uh, talking about covenant upon covenant. And since we just went through this Hebrew class, let me make sure that this PowerPoint works. This is one of my favorite things. We'll bring up this first slide. And what word is that? Bereshit. If you look at the word Bereshit, which is the first word in Genesis, right? And you take out the Aleph and the Sheen, right? You have the, the Beit and the, the Resh, the Yod and the Tuf, and you bring them together. What word do you think that is? It's the word berit, which is the word covenant. So right there in the first word of, the, of Torah is the word covenant. It's, it's pretty amazing. Now covenants are something that we're involved with all the time, believe it or not. They affect our daily lives. And if people understood a little bit more about covenants particularly God's covenants and promises, they would understand their heavenly Father a little bit better. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, and it's, this, is in the, this is in Ephesus, and this is the Gentiles that the Rabbi Shaul or Apostle Paul, and for those of you that are new here tonight, I'd like to welcome you and don't be frustrated with uh, any of the Hebrew words that I might use interchangeably or Greek words or uh, you'll get used to it sooner or later, and um, the notes should help you out. But Rabbi Shaul is the same as the Apostle Paul, and you were at that time without the Mashiach, the, the, the Messiah. You were aliens, now notice this, from the regulations of Israel and strangers to the covenant of the promise, and were without hope and without Elohim in the world. And this is from the Aramaic English New Testament. Now, most of you that know the King James, it says in that verse, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, but here in the Aramaic, it's the regulations of Israel. And strangers to the covenant of, it says promises in King James, but this is, notice, it's the promise. It's talking about the promise. And Israel was identified by Yahweh or by, by God according to their obedience to Torah and to the covenant you know, uh, how many of you have done, you've done painting in your house and you have a certain, you know, the outside of your house? I did this recently. Uh, you know, I had trim on the back of my house. I had to replace and I had a certain color in one place and I wanted to get the paint to match it. So how many of you have done that before? Okay. So you go to Home Depot or you go to Lowe's, you take a paint chip and then somehow they do it miraculously with this microscope, come up with these numbers and squeeze these paints into it and mix it all up and... Lo and behold, it's the same color as the paint that you put on eight years ago. Praise God. <laughs> right? But you know what? Somehow, the information that's in Torah, right? The color of Torah, when people get to the, the Brit Hadashah or the New Testament, the colors don't seem to match up. And so that happens because of errors that are in translation or lack of under, our understanding or wrong teaching. And wrong teaching and ignorance leads to fear. And when we're afraid, we're afraid of our God, uh, we, we can dampen the promises of God, see? So we need to have right teaching and instruction to deal with that. The word covenant in the, the New Testament or the, or the Brit Hadashah is the word uh, diathike, which is the Strong's number, and there's a reason I'm telling you this. It's the Strong's number which identifies the Greek word. It's the number 1242. Now, in Genesis, where Pastor Mark shared this last time about the covenant God made with Noah, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. He, you know, God says he's going to make a covenant with Noah. And that word uh, for a covenant is the word berit, which I just brought up um, on, the, on the screen. That's the same corresponding word to the Greek 
Strong's 1242, if you look at it in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation um, uh, from the Hebrew, which, by the way, uh, one of the things, the three dark days in Israel's history, uh, the 8th, 9th, and 10th of Tevet, which was last week, one of those days they recognize as a dark day because the Septuagint uh, was written, which was the Hebrew translation uh, or the Greek translation of the Hebrew. Uh, however, when Nehemiah Gordon was here, uh, he told me all wasn't lost because uh, the Septuagint is valuable for comparing Hebrew words uh, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew and its Greek counterpart in the New Testament. So there is value to it, the problems in the translations and the transliterations, but the words match up. So that's the kind of thing that it's valuable for. So how many people did I lose just a few seconds ago? <laughs> oh, the rest of you all got it. Okay, well, you'll have to listen to it after. <laughs> you'll be able to sort it out. Okay, in Genesis 15, verse 18, it says, The same day... The Lord made a covenant, Bereth, which is the same, that same Strong's number, 1242, which is, is uh, Bereth, with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given thee this land, from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now this was where the Lord made the covenant with Abraham, the, the, a promise or a compact. And in Acts 3.25, now we're talking about thousands of years later, when Peter is here on the day of Pentecost, or the Feast of Shavuot as it's known, and Peter, it, this is after the Holy Spirit was poured out, they were speaking in tongues, and every man heard him speak in his own language, and the fervor was just high, it was a high time, and uh, Peter speaks this out as part of his, his discourse, in Acts 3.25 he said, you are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant it's that word diatheke, which is the same as buried in Hebrew, which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Now, if this covenant with Abraham didn't make any difference, why would Peter even bother bringing it up? Why didn't he just say, well, you know, before Jesus took off, I don't want to mention this, but we really, you know, the covenant with Abraham, we don't really, that's really done, a, we don't need to worry about that. Well, when we're at the Puyallup Fair and we always have people come by, and how many of you have been to the Puyallup Fair? And you, how many of you work the booth? Okay, and we just have El Shaddai up there in our books and then some of these characters that are in here who work the wonderful characters. And people, people walk by, you know, they walk by and they, El Shaddai, you know, well, you know, that's all done away with anyway. You know, and you have to look at them, well, what, what, now what was that, that that was done away with, you know? And they don't, well, what, what matches up here? It's like the paint doesn't match from Genesis, and it doesn't seem to match up in Acts. You see what I'm saying? And so these covenants that God made, these are, these, this is where God chose a people for himself to accomplish his, peop, his purposes on the earth. Now, this is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the same one that caused the planets to hang in space on nothing, to spin and to revolve around a celestial body with that have gases in it, and galaxies that spin out into eternity that we can barely even see them. It's the same God that made you and me, that made the largest bodies and the most minute particles, and he chose to make a covenant with an individual named Abraham, which is basically an agreement. That's how he chose to reach his people. I think that's a pretty good deal for the creator of the heavens and the earth to do that. Well, how do you know there's a God? Well, just keep reading, you know. God applied the covenant not only to Abraham, but to his descendants as well, Isaac and Jacob. Now, there's four covenants that God made with the house of Israel. It's the Abrahamic or Abraham uh, Moshe, or Mosaic, and the Davidic, which is David, and the New Covenant. And a covenant involves the giving and the administration of God's gracious gifts of blessing to his people. Now, that doesn't sound too bad, does it? I mean, it's just God showing, hey, here's the agreement I'm going to make with you, and it involves the, the, the giving of gracious gifts. Well, how do these all compare? What are the conditions of these covenants and the signs? You know, when people say, well, that's, that's all done away with, well, which thing are you talking about? There's several covenants that are in the old, you know, in the, in the Torah. What exactly are you talking about? Well, 
are there covenants? Let me ask you this. Of other world, of world religions, um, what, what covenants are there with those gods? And if I can get that PowerPoint to just come up now. Now, in the Hindu religion, and I could be wrong on this, okay, because I didn't have time to read all of these books on other religions, but I did a little bit of research on it. Hindus have, Hinduism has, and some of you may be expert, they have many gods, but they don't have any divine covenants. And they end up actually worshiping a lot of violent gods. And then, of course, there's this one that may be familiar to you. Anybody know what that is, if you can read Arabic? That's Allah. And Allah, it says, those who fulfill the covenant of Allah and fail not in their plighted word, to him will be your return of all to you. The promise of Allah is true and sure. It is he who begins the process of creation and repeats it, that he may reward with justice those who believe and work righteousness. But those who reject him will have nothing but drafts of boiling fluids and a penalty grievous because they did reject him. The mention of a covenant in Islam has a particular signification. This, there is a covenant between Allah, the most exalted, the creator, and man, the created. This covenant states that Allah would give a man whatever he needs in this life to be rewarded according to his deeds. Well, I guess that's, that's fairly specific if you need 70 virgins or um, whatever. How about this one? Buddha. The, by the covenant of Buddha, each future teacher is especially reverenced. Uh, in this revelation of possibility is the whole pledge of the future. So in the covenant of Buddha, teachers are, are honored. And then there's a, an oath that you've heard of, which is also in a, co- a covenant that doctors take. It's called the Hippocratic Oath. Have you ever heard, heard of that? It's also a covenant. Did you know it was a Greek covenant? I swear by Apollo, the physician... And Eclipius and Hygieia and Panacea and all the gods and goddesses, making them my witness that I will fulfill according to my ability and judgment this oath and this covenant. That's the Hippocratic Oath or Covenant. How about this one? Taoism. Uh, in, in Taoism, if I can read this correctly here, One element of the covenant with that Chang, who was an obscure healer, uh, he possessed a divine mandate to replace the obsolescent Han government and establish a new social order in its place. He, He claimed the mantle of heavenly master, he and his heirs, and they oversaw a religious organization in which male and female libationers healed the sick by performing expiatory rituals, whatever that is. But that's Taoism. So there is a covenant. Okay, and, uh, but it, it involves basically a man. And then how about this one? Anybody know who that is? Confucius. When Confucius was 47, he was the chief officer of the Chai family. There was someone named Yang Hu. He attacked the head of the family and imprisoned him, forcing him to dis- subscribe and swear to a covenant. And it was basically to take over the other families. So those are some of the covenants of some of the, the world religions that you may, you've heard about through the years. But our God made some specific covenants that had some terrific promises. But what about some modern day covenants? How many of you own homes here? And how many, how many of you own, have a condo or own a condo? And you've heard about covenants. Anybody here have a, a condo? Nobody has a condo. What a mature audience. <laughs> Now this is a secular version of a, of the, of a covenant here. A covenant is, now this is a secular definition. A covenant is a promise in a written contract or a deed of real property. There are different types of covenants such as a covenant of warranty, which is a promise to guarantee the title to the property is free of any claims against it. Covenants which run with the land such as a permanent e- easement of access or restrictions on use are binding on future owners of the property. Covenants can be concurrent, means they run along with each other, mutual promises to be performed at the same time. So there's covenants that have conditions and are uncon- that are conditional and unconditional. Now, if, you have, if you've lived in a condo and you have a, a, a covenant in, your, uh, in a condo, or like on my house, I have a, an easement that goes alongside of my property so the, 
there's a house that lives, is behind us, so they have a covenant to go through my property, which is a real pain in the neck, but nevertheless, it's still there. Or if you, you have a certain covenants with houses where you have a grandmother apartment, that uh, once that clause is in there for that covenant 10 years from now, you can still have your grandmother move in in an apartment. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so it continues, it continues on. These are secular covenants. Well, let's say you know you live in your condo project and you saw, signed your lease five years ago and you pay X amount, you know, $1,100 a month to stay in your condo and then one day you get a letter and it says that, um, uh, that there's a, the, the new pool uh, requires a charge of uh, another $35 a month uh, and that's written into the covenant. So come January 1st, you write a check for $35. January 10th, the landlord calls you and says, where's the $1,100? And you say, what $1,100? I paid the $35 that you just had in the renewed covenant you sent me. And then the landlord says to you, you dope, it includes that part of the covenant too. <laughs> right? So it's a piece that's added to the covenant that still includes your past lease. Well, that's the way these covenants are. It's covenant upon covenant. And so the covenant with Abraham is an important covenant because that's what all of the other covenants are based upon. Our relationship with our creator is based on these covenants. Well, I want to talk real briefly here about the new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, verse 31, this is in your notes. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new Kadesh covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, this word Kodesh, and you may have heard me talk about it before, in the beginning of the, of the month is known as Rosh Kodesh, which is the head of the month. It's the head of the new month, and it's known as the new moon. Right now, I believe it's a full moon that's out. And if this PowerPoint comes up, you'll see what I'm talking about here. This is the new moon where you just begin to see that crescent, okay? And uh, it's, in, it's almost in total darkness. And then as the days go on, it becomes a half moon. And then uh, as, as you get to where we are right now in this time of the month, then it becomes a full moon. So we go from darkness, total darkness, where it comes out into the light. So the beginning of the month is known as Rosh Kadesh. It's a, it's a beginning of a, of a new thing. And that's the way the Jewish people look at it is it's a time to renew. The beginning of the month is anew. And that's what the new moon is significant of. And so the Lord says here in verse 32, it's a covenant that's not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, said the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, I'll put my law in their inward parts, write it on their hearts, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. And then in Ezekiel 36, 26, referring to the same covenant, this new covenant, which really, when you look at the moon, you're not looking at a new moon, okay? This full moon is a, is a full bright moon. It's the same moon. It's just that it's new light, okay? So we're really looking at a renewed moon. It's not a new moon that was created. It's a, it's a renewed. And so when we look at this covenant, that's what that's referring to. It's more or less a renewed, a fresh uh, new bright moon, but not new as far as it being a new celestial or terrestrial body. And in verse 27, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. Now in Luke 22, 20, it says, Likewise, and this is with Yeshua, uh, in the last meal that he had with his disciples, likewise the cup after supper, which I believe is the cup of redemption, uh, for those for those feast uh, scholars, uh, saying that this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant, diatheke, and that word new is the Greek word kainos, which means new, it means newly made, different from that which is former or renew, renewed. It may be a new covenant, but what is it based on? Well, if you look, look at this here, uh, in verse 33, it says, This covenant, this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, said the Lord, what did he say he was going to do in this new covenant? He says, I'm going to put the law, my law, in their inward parts. Now, which law is that? 
Which Torah, which, you know, what is that? That's Torah. And he's going to write it on their hearts. So that's, that is going to be a new thing. Because obviously there was an issue that they were having. It wasn't, it just didn't seem to stick with them. And I'm going to talk about that in just a few minutes. And I will be their God, they shall be my people. So there's conditions for these different covenants that begins with Abraham. And there, there are responses that the Lord expects. And uh, there's also signs of these covenants. And the first one is the, the Abraham's covenant, which was made first with an individual. So it wasn't made with a nation. It was made with an individual, although it extended out to his descendants, which became a nation. And, though, and that can be found in Genesis 12, uh, 1 to 3, and then uh, chapter 7, 15, and 17, 1 through 4. And you can read that on, on your own, but I want to cover some of those points that he mentions about that. Number one, he said he would make Abraham a great nation. God would bless Abraham. God will make Abraham's name great. He will make Abraham a blessing to others. He will bless the ones that bless Abraham, and he will curse those that curse Abraham. And he'll cause all the families of the earth to be blessed through Abraham. Now, Abraham, in, in that chapter, was, he was promised this as a gift. So he didn't do anything. To, there wasn't anything that he did uh, to merit this. Okay? It, was, uh, uh, it was something that was giving him, given to him without any merit. This was before Isaac uh, was born, and he, uh, he took him up to, uh, to sacrifice him. Now, there is a sign that, that's a part of this covenant. When we were in uh, St. Louis, it was really significant in this, in this PowerPoint that's going to come up next. Okay. And I was up there. I know she looked at it. And anybody else that was there besides? Okay. In, the, in St. Louis is right on the Mississippi River. And there's a, a big structure there called the Arch of St. Louis. Has anybody ever seen it? Okay, and you can go up in this arch, and it's really, it overlooks the Mississippi River, and it's known as the gateway to the west. And you, when you go underground to where the elevators are, they have a museum down there. And it was really a terrific museum. It really was about westward expansion and the Indians and Lewis and Clark, because that's Lewis and Clark country right there. That's where they took off from. And in the very beginning, they have this big case and it has all of these, go these coins in them. And they were known as covenant coins. And when the, um, when the government, our government, I don't want to get into this part, <laughs> when they made agreements with the Indians, they, these coins would be a sign of the covenant, that they made these covenants. And that's what these coins were that were in, in these glass cases. I know Carol, Carol saw it because... We were standing there together. Now, there was a sign to Abraham for this covenant. And in Genesis 17, verse 9, God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. How exciting! I'm sure he just, Abraham just jumped for joy. Oh, I couldn't wait. I knew something wasn't right down there, you know. And he just, and he says, you'll circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. It'll be a token, which is the Hebrew word oath, which is also means a sign. Pastor Mark taught that in his teaching on the eclipses of the covenant that's between you and me. And there's a lot of things that are significant about the circumcision, which is a sign of the covenant. And it, it's, it's a cutting away of what? The flesh. It's a cutting away of the flesh. Abraham received the promise. Now here's the sign so that, as every man knows, when he goes to do his duty, you can't miss it. Okay? And he would see the sign of that covenant. But it was also significant of reproduction. And the reproduction of the generations of individuals that would come to remember that covenant, which also involved blood. So there's a number of significant things. But I think one significant thing is that the circumcision is a cutting away of the flesh. And Abraham had some issues in Genesis chapter 16. Because when God gave him the promise that he would have a son, 
There was a number, it didn't happen right away, remember? It was a number of years. And so Abraham got a little bit of antsy, a little bit antsy, and, you know, had some flesh issues, and that's where Hagar came in. And the problem that we are having today in the Middle East was all based on chapter 16. Just a slight glitch in Abraham's believing, okay? So God came back in Genesis 17, okay, this is a sign, you won't forget this one. (laughs) But what about us? Look at Romans 8, verse 5. For they that are after the flesh mind the things of the flesh, and they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. So then that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So there's some cutting away of the flesh that we need to do as well. In Ephesians 2, 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. So it's that lust of the flesh that causes us to, to stumble and not to, apt to, to, to take hold of the promises of the covenant. In Romans 2.29, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. You know, these guys parading around, hey, you need to get circumcised. Yeah, we just, I can't wait, let's line up. You know, it, it's, that's not what it's about. The circumcision that the Lord is looking for is the circumcision, the cutting away of the flesh from the heart. So circumcision was not a condition of the covenant, but it was a sign because God had already made the promise of the covenant with Abraham in Genesis 15. So it wasn't a condition, it was a sign. And it says that in Romans 4, verse 11, it says he received the sign of, which in, in Greek it's the word simeon, it's a sign of, cir- of circumcision, a seal, which is the Greek word shphragos, of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. Okay, so the promise came to him when, we, when he was uncircumcised, not when he was circumcised. So that's not a condition for, for this covenant. And what was the reason? That he might be the father of all them that believe. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. This, this word sign comes up in a number of different places, and it's the Strong's word uh, 4592, and that does correspond to the same word in the, with the Greek, with the Hebrew, for the word uh, for token or sign. And the word seal, the seal of, of, circ- or the, uh, of the righteousness of the faith, is a Strong's word 4973, which, listen to this, it's a signet as fencing in or in protecting from misappropriation, Uh, a stamp that's impressed as a mark of privacy. So you know in 2 Timothy chapter, uh, I believe it's 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, it says, does anybody know what that verse is? Just trying to stimulate your minds for a second there. Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, unless you all want to open your Bibles and look. How many of you have your Bibles with you? Oh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knows them that are his. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So this is a pretty good covenant. And just what, uh, we haven't gone through the other three. I feel pretty good about this one. feel good about this one. How about you? Yeah? Now, the covenant of promise was one of eternal blessing. All other covenants between God and Israel were based on this. And it's, the, the validity of that covenant is confirmed in these following verses. Exodus 2.24, God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and with Jacob. Deuteronomy 4.31 For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee nor destroy thee nor forget the covenant of thy fathers. Psalm 105.8, he has remembered his covenant forever. Boy, you ever make agreements with people about stuff? Hey, you remember that lawnmower that you borrowed from me back there? Now, which lawnmower was that? I mean, we forget the agreements we make with people. God doesn't forget his covenants. He's remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded 
to a thousand generations, which covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and confirmed the same unto Jacob. Luke chapter 1, verse 72, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. Why would that be in the, in the New Testament uh, if it didn't have some bearing to it, particularly when it mentions Abraham? Galatians 3.14, that the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Yeshua the Mashiach, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. My brothers, I speak as a man, even though it be a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no man can reject it or change anything in it. In verse 16, now the promises were made to Abraham and his seed, as a covenant. And in the Aramaic New Testament, which this partic- those particular words came from, there's a play on words there where it means promise, a promise on top of a promise, which means it's a great promise. It's like, I promise, I promise, I promise. God used the covenant as a pattern to explain the design of the covenant of salvation to those who believe. That's why Abraham is called the father of our faith. Yet Abraham was justified before any act of obedience. So it didn't depend on him for circumcision or or offering up Isaac. And because of this, this is biblical faith, which is faith in action. It's a pattern to a, a covenantal response to his promises. And by this promise as Gentiles, who are most of us that are in here, we can say that Abraham is our father also. Now, the, the, the next covenant is, is Moshe's covenant or Moses' covenant. And in Deuteronomy 4, there was a desire um, on God's part to have Israel affect the nations uh, with the knowledge of God and his Torah so Gentiles could participate in this. And that was known because there were strangers that came out Egyptians that came out with the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they could participate as long as they made their allegiance to Elohim, and they took part uh, in the covenant. And this covenant was established in in Exodus, I can't read the whole thing, but chapter 19 through 24 and in chapter 31. But in Exodus 24, and those most of you that have been around for a while, you understand it, Israel came out of Egypt and then they were in Sinai, and this is where, the, where God poured out the Torah, which is also known as the Ketubah, or a marriage covenant. It's a marriage contract, okay? And Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice, and they said, all the words which the Lord had said, we will do. So they agreed to, to what the terms of the covenant. They just told Moses, don't, you know, you go talk to them. We don't want to talk to them. The fire and the smoke and the brimstone and everything else was too much. You go talk to them. And, and so that's what Moses did, and that was the response that the children of Israel had. And so Exodus 19 through 23, uh, they may be regulations or they may be teachings, you know, as I referred to in Ephesians chapter 2. These are the regulations of Israel. They may be those regulations or teachings. But the actual promises to this covenant are in Deuteronomy. Okay, so what God poured out here, and he talks about all of those little regulations in Exodus 24, the actual blessings are in Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy 28.1, it says, It shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord. Then it lists out all these blessings. Ephesians chapter 1, it talks about that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings from on high. Okay? But, th- but here, this, this being conditional, God says, you know, if you'll, you'll do this, these blessings will come upon you. Well, conversely, in 28.15, it says, if it comes to pass, if you won't listen unto the voice of the Lord, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command you this day, that all his curses will come upon you and overtake you. Right? So that's the, the curses. Now, did you know a curse is like a promise? Yeah? 
Look at this PowerPoint. Does this one look familiar? My mother used to say, if you don't get this done, I promise you, you're not going out this weekend. <laughs> so it was like a curse because if I didn't get my work done, I wasn't going to go anywhere on Friday night. So believe it or not, there's the blessings and the curses. The curses are just like promises too. I promise you this is going to happen. But the Lord was basically admonishing him and warning him. You know, if, you know, the word if in these verses, it indicates obedience. So Abraham's covenant was an unconditional covenant. And yet this one here is a conditional covenant. They had to respond with obedience to the regulations and to the teachings. But what was the actual sign of, that, of this covenant? Anybody know? Don't all answer at once. The, it says in Exodus 30, that's right, in Exodus 31, 16, Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a, a what kind of a covenant? A perpetual covenant, which goes on and on. It's a sign, and that's the Strong's number 4592, okay? Same thing as the, the sign of circumcision for Abraham. Between me and the children of Israel forever, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. On the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the Shabbat is a sanctification of time. It's a time that the Lord wants us to cease from work, like we just learned from uh, Rabbi Golub, Mitzvah and uh, it, it's a time to be aligned with God, to rest in him for what he's done for us, to ceasing from striving. And, and it talks about that in Hebrews 4 through Hebrews 6. And, you know, on these verses that I'm going through, and I'm going to move very quickly here, but, you know, we could go off into a lot of rabbit trails. So there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm not, verses I'm not uh, enhancing on or going into. These will be covered uh, through the weeks with Pastor Mark, uh, when we get into, he's going to get into uh, Rabbi Shaul or Apostle Paul. We're going to get into the book of Acts as compared to things in Torah, uh, the book of Hebrews, Galatians, Romans, the difficult verses, but all how they relate to these covenants. See? So the Torah was given to protect the people so that they could enjoy the blessings of the promises. If the covenant of Abraham was a covenant of promise, Moses' covenant was a promise of, of dwelling in the promises. Okay? And the only way that they could, be, they could enjoy those blessings, they needed a fence. The Torah was the fence to protect them. Disobedient, res, disobedience resulted in them not enjoying the promises. Now look at Galatians 3, verse 19. This is from the Aramaic English New Testament. Why then Torah? It was added because of apostasy until the coming of the heir to whom the promise was made. Torah was not the promise. It established the conditions under which the terms of the covenant could be kept. So you're not justified by Torah or by the law. It's the fence so that you, you can enjoy the promises. It just established the conditions under which the terms of the covenant could be kept. In Galatians 3.11, but that no man is justified by Torah in the sight of God. It is evident for the just shall live by what? Faith. We have to trust in God for our righteousness and then allow the imparted righteousness to live itself out as we follow God's word. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how that's done or why it's done when I, just in just a few minutes here. Lord, help me. The Davidic covenant. First of all, in the Davidic covenant, which was King David, there is no covenant word, and, and this is where when... David is first addressed is when he is anointed by Samuel, and this is after Saul, uh, uh, you know, made some big mistakes, uh, made a big mistake, and David was anointed by Samuel. Uh, but yet, in these chapters, there's no covenant word, that covenant word, berit, in 2 Samuel 7, but it is later, which I listed these verses out for you, in 2 Samuel 23... 
which is the end of, the, of David's life, he says, now these be the last words of David. In verse 5, yea, does not my house stand so with God, for he has made me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and secure, for he will not cause to prosper all my help and my desire? In Psalm 89.3, I've made a covenant, Berith, I have sworn unto David, my servant, my chosen. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Psalm 132, 11, the Lord hath sworn in truth unto David, he will not turn for it, from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set thy throne. If thy children will keep thy covenant, Berit, and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children also shall sit upon the throne forevermore. So now when you look at these in 2 Samuel chapter 7, which of these promises, the promises of the covenant, they all have specifics that overlap with the Abrahamic covenant. 2 Samuel 7, Now therefore say unto my servant David, the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheep coat, from following sheep, to be a ruler over my people Israel. Now you know that David's the kingly line of David that he established which was through Jesse, which was through Ruth, okay, uh, was the kingly line of what, which Yeshua would come, Jesus would come out of. He established the throne for the coming Mashiach or Messiah. In 2 Samuel 7.10, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own. See, this is a secure place for Israel. That's why that banner on those metro buses really got, has me ticked off here. Second Samuel 7, 12. And when thy days be fulfilled and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up my seed after them, and will, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom, which means he'll have offspring. Second Samuel 7, 12. And when thy days be fulfilled and you sleep with your fathers, I'll set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And thine house and thine kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. So not only would he have offspring, he would have a kingly line that would descend from him. In 2 Samuel 7.24, thou hast confirmed to thyself thy people Israel to be a people unto thee forever. And thou, Lord, art become their God. So Israel are God's people. So in verse 29, therefore now let it please thee to bless the house of thy servant, that it may continue forever before thee. O Lord God, hast thou spoken it with the blessing. Let the house of thy servant be blessed forever. So he would have God's blessing forever. And how did David respond to that? This shows what his response to that covenant was. He said, who am I, O Lord? I was just a, I was just a shepherd. Who am I, O Lord? What is my house that you brought me hitherto? And what can David say more of thee? For thou, Lord God, knows thy servant. David was aware that he wasn't deserving, yet he accepted the covenant by what? By faith. It's unconditional in the sense that he wasn't deserving, yet it was conditional. There was a conditional element in keeping Torah, but it didn't affect the eternal nature of the covenant. And what was the sign of the covenant? And and there are different schools of thought about what the sign of the covenant was because it doesn't say specifically a sign. But what carries forth right after David's, David's discourse on this is his desire to build the Lord a house, which he never did. Uh, but he, the commission was given to, uh, to David to do it, but it was given to Solomon to build it. And so some say that the sign of this covenant was the house, the house of the Lord. The promise was followed by his expression to build it. So these promises are very similar to Abraham's promises. Now, now we're going to close here on this part with the new covenant. And there are rabbinic writings that refer to the giving of Torah, of a new Torah. This is from uh, Yalkut, uh, who was a a sage in the Middle Ages on Isaiah 26. The Holy One, blessed be he, will sit in paradise and give instruction. And all the righteous will sit before him, and all the host of heaven will stand on his right, and the sun and the stars on his left. And the Holy One, blessed be he, interprets to them the grounds of a new Torah, which the Holy One, blessed be he, will give them by the hand of King Messiah. See? 
And this is, there's all kinds of writings with the sages who point to the Messiah. And so again, what is this covenant? Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And uh, it says, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband to them. There was nothing wrong with the covenant. It was the, it, and it wasn't when we get into Hebrews, you're going to see the verbiage. It wasn't anything wrong with the covenant. It was the people. It was their faith. They were the ones that broke the covenant. And so the Mesuza, the Tefillin, the Tzitzit are all present reminders that the Jewish people had to keep the commandments. And although these are, are reminders, and they're in, two of them are in Torah, or it's actually in the Shema as well, they can't produce submission or give power to keep the commandments. So how does God do it? Where does the power come from then to be able to live righteously? And that answer is in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. He's going to take this heart and he's going to give us a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I'll take the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh on which his word will be written. This word here for new, corresponding in the Greek, is that word kainos, which means newly made, but it's different from that which is former. So it's renewed. Verse 27, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my commandments and do them. So flesh is, is, is flesh, spirit is spirit, and Yeshua said it's the spirit that quickens. So the pouring out of Holy Spirit on the Feast of Shavuot of Pentecost has a lot to do with that word being written on our hearts. It's where the flesh is cut away, okay? The provisions of this covenant, I'll put my law in their minds, I'll write it on their hearts, I will be their God. Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. I will forgive their iniquity, will bring you into your own land. You shall be clean from all your filthiness, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. We try today our best that we can to do that. Do we always succeed? So we had to be put in a state where we would be constantly granted forgiveness of sins because the sacrifices, every time the people sinned, there were sacrifices that had to be continually brought to the temple in one place, Jerusalem, at the temple. But with Yeshua's blood, we're in a state of being granted continually forgiveness of sins. Until one day, when the covenant is complete, we'll have that Torah to where we'll know our God. We'll, we, the, the, the limitations of the flesh will no longer affect us. And so what we see here is we see God renewing. We see a relationship with Torah. And we see the regathering of a nation into the promised lands. What God does is unconditional, but what people do, it is conditional upon faith and obedience. Now, not to be justified, okay, because we're not justified by the law. That's the free gift. But to be sanctified is where it requires us to be uh, to obedience to that written word, a circumcised heart. In Romans 2.29, and I'm almost done here, uh, he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter. And also the Shabbat rest, Hebrews 4.10. He that has entered into his rest has ceased from his own works. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. And our hearts are also uh, for being a temple for the Holy Spirit. Know ye not in First. Corinthians 3.16, that you're the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Colossians 3.1, if ye then be risen with Christ, or since you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You know where it says in Hebrews we have a high priest in the heavenly sanctuary? Which sanctuary is that? He's in the heavenly sanctuary. He forever, he's forever making intercession for you. That's where we need to set our affection. 
And in Colossians 3.10, and having put on the new man, now this word new here is different than kainos. It says, put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. This word neos is not two separate words, new man. It's one word, and it means that which is lately established or originated. So there is something that happens with Ruach HaKodesh, or Holy Spirit, that enables an individual to be able to carry out Torah. And that's why it's specifically in here and also Ephesians where it talks about being renewed in the spirit of your mind. It speaks specifically about something that's, that's genuinely new. And why do people have issues? It always boils down to Romans 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That, that, that word there, inokinosis, means literally a new up that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Inokinosis, which means a renovation, which different from that which is formerly. You know, another sign of the covenant, of the new covenant, is love, where Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, and by this they will know that you're my disciples. Galatians 5, 6, in the Aramaic English New Testament, but in Mashiach Yeshua, Circumcision and circumcision are nothing but faith, which is completed by love. In the Greek it says faith is energized by love. And that love is only a love that, that our Heavenly Father, according to his covenants, can give us, which is not the love which is of the world. We're one with Messiah. We have the same spiritual benefits as Israel. And we are grafted into citizenship. And all the basis of this covenant, that's the sign, is in Ephesians 2.13. But now by Yeshua Mashiach, you who were before were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Mashiach. So that's Yeshua who is our cornerstone. And it's in him that we can have a new mind. Amen? Let's all stand. Did you learn something tonight? A little bit? Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for, uh, Father, making these promises to us. And, Lord, these aren't, how would, why would we ever think, Lord, that we'd want to take your promises and cast them away and say they don't apply to us anymore? Or that the blood of Yeshua, Father, would, uh, that it means nothing, but that, Father, it's all based upon these covenants that you made with your people, of which we were grafted into. How gracious and how generous you are, always doing good things for us. We bless you and we love you. And thank you, Father, for bringing us to this day and time. In spite of all the things and the perversity of the world, you cause us to shine forth somehow as lights in a dark and perverted nation. We love you. We bless you in Yeshua's name. Thank you for staying with us today. God bless. Good night. If you have any questions regarding the material discussed, please contact me at my email address. It's pastormark at elshadiministries.com. Be blessed and shalom.